Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. And isn't it exciting? We've got to part five of our story tonight. So we're going to reach the conclusion of what in fact did happen to Isla. So before we get to our story, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with part five of our story. I hope you're proud of yourself, young lady, for what you've done. You should be ashamed of yourself. You cut that poor woman's life short. Even though she didn't know about the affair, she lightly sensed it. Women always do. They have a sixth sense, you know. If my husband had an affair, I'd know at once, wouldn't I, dear? She said to her husband. Isla's father made a strange, uncomfortable noise at the back of his throat. His face flushed as red as a field of poppies. Sweetheart, I think that is uncalled for, he said. You heard Isla here. She's very sorry about what happened. Can we not move beyond this, please? Stop throwing stones at each other. That's what you would like, isn't it, Eric? But our daughter here has brought shame on our family. And you're willing to just let it go like that at a snap of an elastic band? It doesn't work like that. The damage has been done. You have no idea how embarrassed I am. Because I had to tell Father Peters about the fact that our daughter here was having an affair with a married man. It looks so bad on me. Like I never raised our daughter right to respect her God-given boundaries. The proof will be in the pudding when Isla gets her memory back. You mark my words, she'll return to that man like a pig returns to its muck. And as for you, May Holmes, I hope you're proud of yourself, said Isla's mother, turning to her grandmother with an accusatory expression on her face. You're not setting a fine example for your granddaughter, are you? I may be judging my daughter's character, but you are not any better, are you? You're a fine example on my daughter, you are. I know exactly what's been going on. What is all this about, Margaret? asked my father. Why are you running my mother down like this? Your mother is currently involved with a man who's only recently become widowed. The man's wife died not very long ago. Your mother is fraternising with him shamelessly. Throwing herself at him, she is. It's disgusting, immoral, completely insensitive. People have seen them together in town, walking hand in hand down the beach eating food together at a fancy restaurant. What kind of an example are you setting for our daughter, May? Nothing untoward is going on, Margaret, said my grandmother. Weston is a gentleman, he really is. He's the one that found Isla on the beach. He called the emergency services. I met him at the hospital, you know. We enjoy dinner together. I like him very much. And yes, I did hold his hand on the beach. But nothing has happened between us. We're very good friends, that's all. He misses his wife dreadfully. And I appreciate that, you know. He needs plenty of time to grieve. But like me, he's lonely. He needs friends. He's from Houston in Texas. Doesn't know many people around here. I think he appreciates our friendship. I've introduced him to some very nice people around here. My mother rolls her judgmental dark eyes in the back of her head, her face contorting in disgust. So you make a habit, do you, May, of holding your friend's hands? This man is recently bereaved. He needs time to grieve. But you pounce on him like a hungry tiger. You're a disgrace, said my mother, giving my grandmother a glare. Do you have any idea how bad this looks? People are talking about you. They're not saying very nice things, you know. Is this necessary, Margaret? says my father. For the record, I think you're being completely unreasonable. 
My mother has been on her own for fifteen long years. I think she's entitled to some happiness, don't you? If she's met someone, I'm happy for her. Eric, Eric, listen to yourself. You always defend the sinner to justify immoral behaviour. You're like the sheep following the rest of the herd over the cliff. I'm sorry, but the way I see it, it's morally repugnant for your mother to be going out with a recently bereaved man. I understand where you're coming from, Margaret, and how important your religious beliefs are to you," said my grandmother. "But don't take the moral high ground with me, dear. Weston is a lonely man, and he's lonely without his wife around." And without knowing many people in these parts, he appreciates my friendship with him. He even told me as much. But he doesn't want to get involved with anyone just yet, and he made that very clear to me. And I do understand it. But you still decided to throw yourself at him, for good measure, did you? My grandmother groaned. Oh, Margaret, listen to yourself, my dear. I know you're a very religious woman, and I do appreciate where you're coming from, as I say. But I hate the way you always believe the very worst in people, never giving them the benefit of the doubt, and that is most unkind of you. You view the world from a very distorted lens. You do. I am very happy to have made a good friend in Weston Taylor. If you were wearing my shoes and were my age, and my son wasn't around for you, I'm sure you would be very grateful for a good friendship. Oh, please, May! I'm nothing like you, and I never will be. Do I look as if I was born yesterday? I don't know why I bothered to come here today. I have a repentant daughter, do I, May? Repentance is when someone remembers what they actually did and regrets it. How can Isla here repent of something when she has no memory of what she's repenting of? It's easy to be sorry for doing something that you have no recollection of actually doing. Right, I've had enough, Margaret. Said my grandmother, stiffening. I would appreciate it if you would leave right now. You have outstayed your welcome. You throw all kinds of false accusations at me, and furthermore, you condemn your own daughter in the way that you do. You're the one that's disgusting, not me. You call yourself a Christian, but where is your compassionate heart? Where is your spirit of forgiveness? There isn't any, is there? You're a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what you are. Now, will you get out of here now? I'm very happy to go, but I will remind you: you were the one May that invited me here against my will, but I still came. You're throwing me out because you don't like to face the truth. Out," said my grandmother. Ushering my mother towards the door, out and don't you dare come back! She assured my father that he was the one that was welcome to stay. I'm more than happy to go," said my mother. "And if you want to repent, Isla, for what you've actually done, it might be a start if you remember your sin first. And with that, she pushed my father ahead of her, as if he was a dog on a leash. I watched them both leaving my grandmother's house. With a tortured regret, my mother was an impossible woman, whose paradigm of the world was caught up in a bubble that could not be punctured. She was mulishly stubborn, set in her ways, and had a dogged attitude of grandiosity and vaingloriousness that made me feel that she had looked down upon me and my grandmother as if we were lower forms of pond life that needed to apologise for daring to exist because we contaminated the pond water. My father looked like a beaten-down dog that had received a flogging, and my mother looked so self-important. She shook her head in exasperation as she looked towards my grandmother's house and climbed into her very immodest silver BMW. She drove away at the speed of a rocket, 
leaving me and my grandmother feeling dishevelled, like two chickens in a coop, whom had enjoyed an unfortunate rendezvous with a fox and felt rather battered from the experience. My grandmother shuddered. Then she composed herself and straightened her back in the chair. Well, that went well, didn't it? Not only were you attacked, my dear, but so was I. That was a turn up for the books. The woman is so incredibly self-righteous, is she not? I'm so sorry, dear, that you had to witness all that. I should never have invited your mother around. It really was a catastrophic mistake for me to make. It wasn't a mistake, I assured my grandmother. It was important for me to meet my parents. I may not remember them, but at least I got a sense of what my mother's like. And as you say, she's an objectionable woman. And as for my poor father, he's so downtrodden by her. I do still agree with my mother that I shouldn't have got involved with a married man. But she was wrong about you and Weston. I'm glad the two of you have a great friendship together. And don't let anything my mother says discourage you. Don't you worry, dear. That woman has absolutely no influence over my life whatsoever. One month later, I stare out of the seamless floor-to-ceiling windows of Weston's contemporary home, overlooking spectacular prepossessing views of the aquamarine ocean and the long golden stretch of beach sand. I'm glad to be here, even though this is the very beach where I was found, washed up on the shore, tangled among the seaweed, looking like a waxy mannequin. It's a sobering thought. I have this entire place all to myself. I agree to stay in Western steel and glass state-of-the-art home for the entire week, in order to look after Trout and give him his regular morning and evening walks. Mopsy and Henry the Eighth are also in the house with me. Surprisingly enough, Trout is getting on famously with my grandmother's white Maltese poodle. I believe he thoroughly enjoys having another dog around the place and Mopsy has always liked interacting with larger dogs, although he falsely believes he's infinitely superior to Trout in every way. But their differences have been ironed out, like the creases in a shirt, as they're currently both lying very snugly at my feet, as I sit back on Weston's comfortable sofa watching television. As for Henry the Eighth, let's just say Trout is viewing the Persian cat with a degree of scepticism especially after Henry the Eighth lashed out at him with his sharp talons, growling warningly at him when Trout unabashedly began pushing his nose into the cat's chest to smell him more closely. I suspect Henry the Eighth was not remotely amused. He's not used to big dogs and their wet noses and slobbery kisses. My grandmother's relationship with Weston is growing from strength to strength. They're incredibly good friends now. My grandmother had taken Weston to Fairbanks in Alaska to stay with her sister. Weston has never been to Alaska before and always wanted to go. I had agreed to give Trout a walk every morning and every evening. Obstensively, when I took Trout for his morning walk on the beach, I got the overwhelming sense that I was being followed, but nothing was ever there. I guess I'm still rather nervous. I cannot shake the feeling that someone was trying to harm me when I found myself drowning in the ocean, that on the surface looked so benign, so welcoming, but I have hands-on experience of knowing just how treacherous the waters can be. I have often woken up in the middle of the night, frantically wrestling with my sheets, my body breaking out into an ice-cold sweat, as I relive the harrowing nightmare of fighting for my life in the vindictive, spiteful, icy-cold water of the ocean. My memory still has not returned to me, but Dr. Valensky assures me it will take a while for it to come back. I'm still taking life very cautiously, one day at a time. I did meet up with a couple of college friends recently, who affirmed to me how madly in love I was with Drew Sanguistine, who had unabashedly swept me off my feet, showering me with an abundance of gifts and an excess of romantic poetry. The more I learn about my relationship with this man, the less I like him. I have been looking at photographs of him that my best friend Holly had taken of the both of us together. There I am, hanging on to his arms, looking into his eyes as if he's a demigod. And when I look at those photographs, I feel my stomach heave in revulsion. 
He never liked me taking pictures of the two of you together. He was probably afraid his wife might see them. You were getting frustrated with him, my friend Holly told me. He kept telling you he was going to tell his wife about your relationship, that he was going to divorce her, and then you were both going to get married. But he never did tell his wife about the two of you, and that upset you a great deal. Holly looked a little embarrassed when she told me all this. She had had a feeling that Drew was not committed to me in any way, and probably had no intention of leaving his wife on my behalf. I think you were being played, she told me honestly. I never liked him. There was something about him that gave me the creeps. I think that clop on the head you received has likely helped you to see sense. So some good came out of the bad. You're not seeing him again as the very best decision you've ever made, especially now his wife died after that massive stroke. It's the two kids I feel sorry for. I'm just surprised that man has agreed to leave you alone. That's all I'm saying. Drew was an intense person. He had an ego on him, and he couldn't handle rejection. I'm personally surprised that Drew has agreed to leave you alone. That's all I'm saying," said Holly gingerly. "Drew was an intense person, you know. I doubt his ego can handle rejection. Well, I believe he wasn't happy at the hospital when I refused to see him. I tell Holly, he threw a bouquet of flowers he brought me all over the foyer, stamped his feet in indignation. He was escorted off the premises by the hospital security. Sounds exactly like him," said Holly. "I don't doubt he'd have taken your refusal to see him not very well." Even if you do have amnesia, it had been a miserable, overcast day, and for a while it had been raining. It is such a grey day that even the sky looks lugubriously sorrowful. I've heard a few shrieks from the seagulls and seen a couple of sailboats on the horizon that are brazenly weathering this rather sad weather, and I find myself pondering how any one could be out on the water with the weather this bad. Soon it begins to bucket down with rain. And I can hear the wind whistling and wailing, and even though this house is made of steel and glass, the windows are rattling precariously. I can see that I'm going to have to take a rain check on Trout's Walk this afternoon. There is no way I'm going to brave a walk on the beach in weather conditions like this. There is not a solitary soul in sight on the beach, but the two sailboats still remain on the ocean, clearly unfrazed by the less than congenial weather conditions. It feels rather nippy today. The wet weather has made the temperatures plummet and dip considerably. I busy myself making a tasty tuna melt sandwich in Weston's state-of-the-art kitchen, which I enjoy with a glass of wine. I feed the dogs and cat, and lie down again on the fabulously comfortable settee. I switch on the gas fire that impersonates a real log fire with fake logs and coal, but this new age technology does not please me greatly. I'm sorry, but you can't beat the real thing. Western's television is impressively large. I proceed to flick through the television stations, and eventually I settle on watching a movie. Western's furniture is so deliciously comfortable that I soon drift off into the world of my dreams, and am rudely flung out of them with a start when I hear a loud banging at the front door. It is like being violently jerked forward in a car. Weston's living room is steeped in darkness. Thankfully, a couple of uplighters against the wall cast soft shadows around the room, so that I can see the contours of the furniture. I feel the weight of King Henry on my body. The two dogs have already dashed towards the front door and are barking loudly, tails wagging. I push Henry the Eighth off my body. The cat is not impressed. I try to acclimatize to my bearings. My mind a foggy muddle. I am extremely annoyed to be so rudely awoken. I briefly glance at the clock on the mantel. It's four o'clock in the morning. You have got to be kidding me. Have I really been asleep for this long? It seems like only a moment ago it was seven o'clock. Where did the evening get to? Who would be calling this early in the morning? This is crazy. Should I be worried? I wonder as my heart pounds violently in my chest, for I sense that someone being at the door this early. Is not a good thing. I wonder if I should ignore this knocking, but the dog's insistent barking drags me to the door. I cling nervously to a cast iron fire poker in my hand as a weapon of defence that is clearly not used for a fake fire, but is there as a real accessory. 
I hold it up in the air in a striking position and cautiously tiptoe towards the front door, switching on lights along the way so that the dark shadows are cast out of their hiding places. Trout is scratching at the door eagerly, whimpering with excitement, while Mopsy is yapping in the way that Maltesers do and increases the intensity of his barks when the rapping on the door continues. I stand yards away from the door, with a fire poker raised in my hand, calling out, Who's there? Who's there? It's me, Isla. I need to speak with you, comes a male voice. Who are you? I call out. I don't know you. Please will you go? Leave me alone. I don't know who you think you are, calling on me at this outrageous time of the morning. My name is Drew Sanguiston. You and I were very close at one point. You may not remember me because you have amnesia, I'm told. But I need to see you. We need to talk. It's very important. I don't remember you, Drew, but I know all about you from my grandmother. I know I made a big, big mistake getting involved with you. I really regret my decision. I should never have got involved with a married man with children who's old enough to be my father. I don't know who you think you are disturbing me at this late time or how you even knew I was staying at this house. But go away. I've got nothing to say to you. I've made my position with you clear. So you want to leave it like this, do you? All this bad blood between us? You've got nothing to say to me, have you? Fair enough. But we were in a relationship together. Don't you at least have the decency to hear me out? And then I will go and never speak to you ever again. I've come to see you because I believe you're in danger. I think I know what happened to you and why you found yourself washed up on the beach. Someone tried to kill you. I can help you put the pieces together. I understand that you've lost your memory. I can help you find the answers you're looking for. It was Drew Sanguistine telling me that I was in danger and that someone had tried to kill me that made me open up the door to him. This was the question that haunted me day and night. I unequivocally knew that my struggle in the ocean in that dark water was no accident at all. So if this man, whoever he was, had answers for me, I wanted to hear them, even though I didn't want to see him at all. But I reluctantly unlatched the door and let him in, along with full cold gasps of cold air. I put down the fire poker and was grateful I was fully dressed and was wearing my sweatpants. The dogs were bouncing all around Drew excitedly, but then they distanced themselves from him, as if they suddenly had taken a dislike to him. Thank you very much for agreeing to see me, Isla. It's good to see you. Do you really have no memory of me? I'm sorry, I don't, I said. Do I not even look remotely familiar to you? He asked me, following me into the house, where I led him into the living room and beckoned for him to take a seat, which he does, but he sits at the edge of the seat as if not entirely comfortable, and adamantly declines my offer for a drink. To my amazement I find Trout is lying between us, as if guarding me from this stranger, while Mopsy is sitting in my lap growling at Drew, and looking at him with suspicious dark eyes. At first they seem to have welcomed Drew into the house, but now the dogs seem uncertain about him, and as for Henry the Eighth, he's nowhere to be seen. I sneakily suspect he's made himself comfortable upstairs, on Weston's king-size bed. I'm not comfortable being face to face with this odorous man. I hoped I'd never see him again. But if he can shed light on what happened to me that night... I'm eager to hear what he has to say, but I don't feel remotely comfortable in this man's presence. I can't believe I was ever attracted to him. My heart is fluttering, but not in a good way. I feel as if a panicking pigeon is caught up in my chest, desperate to escape. The area above my lips is breaking out into a sweat. I'm wondering whether it was a wise idea to let this man into my house after all. I might have dated him for a while, but it does not mean I can actually trust him. I notice Drew really is as old as my father, but he's got a cockiness about him that I find unbecoming. He's about six foot tall, lean and well-built. I guess he takes good care of himself, 
with regular workouts at the gym. His face is square-shaped, his eyes dark and piercing. He has a distinctive Roman nose, and his skin has a rough, ruddy texture, which suggests to me he might have had bad acne when he was a young man. He's not bad-looking, but there is something about him that turns my blood icy cold. He's wearing a duffel jacket over these tight black pants that cling to his body like rubber, and a pair of leather flip-flops on his feet. His clothes seem rather peculiar. So this memory of yours, it's likely to come back, is it? He asks me gingerly. The doctor thinks it's only a matter of time before that happens. Tell me, how do you know that I'm at this house? And why do you say I'm in danger? I need to hear what you have to say. I've been trying to figure out everything that's been happening, because I know someone tried to kill me. The reason why I know you're here at this house is because I've been following you around, Isla, to make sure you're safe. Because as I keep telling you, someone is trying to harm you. Someone's trying to harm me. Why didn't you tell the police about this? Didn't they interview you? Drew gives me a gormless grin. I'm sure you know, Isla, that there are some things you don't share with the police. Don't talk in riddles, Drew. You're scaring me. Please tell me, who is trying to hurt me and why? Are you really that stupid, Isla? Are you that naive? Do you not even remember that you were responsible for my wife's fortuitous death? But you conveniently forgot all about that, didn't you? I was, I asked, confounded. But your wife had a massive stroke. How can I possibly be responsible for that? You are to blame for my wife's death, Isla. You couldn't keep your bloody trap shut, could you? No, you couldn't. You're such a busybody, putting your nose into everybody's business. I loved my wife, Isla. I was never going to leave her for the likes of you. Never. But you got it into your silly little naive head that I was going to divorce my wife and that you and me were going to get married and live happily ever after. More fool you. Like that was ever going to happen. Do you think that I'd ever settle down with a girl like you? Not in a million years. You don't hold a candle to my wife, and you never could. My grandmother told me, Drew, that you had assured me you'd end things with your wife. But she believed you were stringing me along. So you were all the time. You were never ever serious about me, were you? Drew began to clap his hand. Well done. Your grandmother was right, Isla. Of course I was stringing you along. Only you were far too dim to see it. I stare at Drew incredulously, with my eyes widening. So I was just a plaything for you. You were using me. Pretty much, said Drew, shaking his head. But then you did something very, very stupid without even consulting me. Something that made me furiously angry, Isla. You went to see my wife, didn't you? You went to visit her at my house to tell her about our affair. You told her that we were both madly in love with each other, that I wanted to divorce her and we were going to get married. You told her I'd struggled to tell her this as I didn't want to hurt her feelings. When I returned home to my wife, she was grievously upset, very overwrought. She was lying in a fetal position on the kitchen floor, sobbing her heart out. She was devastated to find out about us. She was inconsolable with grief. It was thanks to you sticking your neck in where it wasn't wanted that I saw my wife withering away like a dying flower in a vase. I told you that I would sort everything out, but I never intended to. Because I loved my wife. I never loved you, Isla. I assured her you meant nothing to me. But a few hours later, a few hours later, after your visit with my wife, she dies of a massive stroke. 
brought on by what you told her. So yes, Isla, you are responsible for my wife's death. My children no longer have their mother. I no longer have the only woman that I ever loved. You, Isla, you took that all away from me. You're a prize bitch, that's what you are. You didn't care about tearing my family apart to get exactly what you wanted. And you really thought that I wanted you. That I was willing to exchange you for my wife. You're as mad as a March hare you are. I am so sorry, Drew. I can't imagine how devastating it must have been for you to lose your wife. I must have felt confident that we were in love. That's why I probably told her. But looking at things objectively, I should never have got involved with you in the first place. But you're also responsible, because you cheated on her with me. If you loved your wife as much as you claim, why would you do something like that to her? How dare you, Isla? How dare you speak to me like that? You were just a plaything. Nothing serious. The next thing I know, Drew is shaking me violently hard. I never loved you, Isla. But you, you thought I did. More fool you. You decided to ruin my marriage by telling my wife everything. And you inadvertently murdered my wife because your words killed her. So you know what I did? I pretended to you that I was happy about my wife's death. I was staying at my mother's house, so I had an alibi. In the middle of the night, I crept out while your grandmother was celebrating her sister's 80th birthday in Fairbanks, Alaska. I came to see you. You were thrilled to see me. All you could talk about was how wonderful it is that we could finally be together. How serendipitous it was. Now my wife was dead, there would be no messy divorce as you could adopt my kids. I told you I'd planned a trip on a motorboat with a picnic for us to celebrate the good news. You were so excited, saying how romantic I was. It was early in the morning. This time, I think it was. We were out on the ocean together. I told you I'd planned a lovely little trip for us on my motorboat with a picnic and lots of champagne. You were thrilled, saying how romantic I was. It was early in the morning when we were out on the ocean. It must have been about this time. I told you we'd watch the sunset together. Oh my God! It was you! You! You were the one that pushed me into the water! Clever girl, Isla. You're finally working it out after all this time. But a little late in the day, isn't it? There you were trying to open a bottle of French champagne with your back turned away from me. I hit you on the back of the head so hard, throwing you into the ocean. You went down like a rock, but then you managed to resurface again. I honestly don't know how you survived. I really don't. So yes, Isla, the only person you're in danger from is me. Number one, I can't risk you remembering what happened. Number two, I need to finish what I started. And number three, Isla, I hate you. I really hate you. Do you think I'm going to let you live after you murdered my wife? It's not going to happen, Isla. You ruined my life. So this time, we're going to do things properly. Drew withdrew a revolver from his pocket, placing it at my head. Now you're going to do exactly what I say, Isla. And you are going to walk out of this house onto the beach. And if you dare scream, I'll kill you in an instant. Look, Drew, please don't be like this. I must have meant something to you once. You must have liked me a little bit. I say trembling, tears spilling down my cheeks. You're being unreasonable and unfair. I'm really sorry about your wife's stroke. And maybe I contributed to it by upsetting her. But I didn't set out to kill her. Surely you know that. And I'm really, really sorry about what happened. Drew became angry, 
Won't you shut up, Isla? There's nothing more to be said. You killed my wife. You don't have to pull the trigger to kill someone. You upset her. You grieved her heart. You killed her. And you're going to pay for this, Isla. Drew is waving the revolver around and telling me to put the dogs in the kitchen as Trout is growling at him and looks as if he's about to attack Drew, as if he senses something is terribly wrong, while Mopsy is baring his teeth at Drew and yakking non-stop. I lead the dogs into the kitchen and close the door behind them. They continue to bark frenziedly, frantically scraping at the door, desperate to get out. I am so numb with fear. I just do everything Drew tells me to do, wondering how I'm going to get out of this dreadful pickle. It's clear to me that Drew intends to harm me and kill me. If I scream for help, I'm dead. But whatever I do, I'm probably living on borrowed time. Drew leads the way from me out of Weston's house. Soon I'm staggering down four concrete steps, still wet from the rain, to the beach below. The weather is furiously angry as a wind is whipping across the beach. The capricious trees on the edge of the beach are swinging their boughs furiously, while the waves are crashing thunderously against the shore. There is a full moon hanging low in the inky sky, like a magnificent pearly button sewn on an extravagant velvety evening gown. A silvery moon spills generously onto the beach, skimming across the ocean. It would be beguilingly pretty if I wasn't so desperately afraid, too afraid to fully appreciate it. My heart is booming thunderously in my chest that I can hear every single vibration. The sand is cold against my naked feet. I am frozen with terror, like a mouse trapped in a cat's jaws. I know not what to do. I want to fight back, scream, but I seem incompetent and incapable of doing anything as if surrendering to my impending fate. But I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Walk into the water now, says Drew. Please, please don't do this, Drew. Please, I beg. The water is icy cold. I don't want to die this way. I don't want to die, Drew. I told you I'm sorry about your wife. I'm really sorry. Please be reasonable, Drew. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm begging you. Listen to me. I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to tell the police about you. I mean, I know your kids need their father. And they've already lost their mother. Can't we just move on from here? I won't tell them a thing. You forget, Isla. I don't care about that. I don't want you breathing the same oxygen as me. Do you understand? You killed my wife. You forfeited the right to live. You deserve to die. I tread into the icy cold water, with Drew plunging into the waves, as he continually points the revolver at my temple, and we go deeper and deeper into the ocean. Maybe it would be better if he shot me. Dying in the ocean a second time around is too hard for me to envisage. It is so icy, so dreadfully cold, that it shoots through me in painful spasms. I realise that Drew is wearing a wetsuit underneath the duffel coat to protect himself from the cold water. He's pressing the revolver tightly against my temple, leading me further and further into the ocean until the water reaches under my arms. It is so cold. My body is going numb at the shock of the water, along with the icy cold wind blasting me from every side. Then I know what Drew is going to do. It's all too clear. He's going to drown me, and the next thing I know, he slips his revolver in his pocket and wrestles me under the water. I try to fight back, but I am no match for him. I feel myself fading very fast, and after a while, a serene peace seems to wash over me, and then for some reason that I cannot explain, Drew lets go of me, and I quickly come to the surface, gasping for breath. Then I see it. Something powerful, something big is pulling Drew off me. That's when I see the Bigfoot with the large yellow eyes, dragging Drew through the water like a sack of potatoes. Drew looks as if he's out cold, so I suspect the Bigfoot has hit him hard across the head. I frantically swim, dashing through the water, 
the spirited waves crashing against me. It is bitterly cold, so treacherously cold. But I reach the beach. The Bigfoot is standing over Drew. His yellow eyes meet mine. Kila takwa, hotali ba. Go home. Get warm, he says. Thank you. Thank you, I say. Not understanding how I could understand what the Bigfoot was saying to me. My body is cold. The first thing I do when I get back is to pull my clothes off before I even enter Weston's house. I run into the bathroom, dry myself with a towel and get under a warm shower until my body begins to warm up. And that's when I call the emergency services. Drew is quickly taken to hospital. When he recovers, he's arrested and charged with two counts of attempted murder and is still in prison to this day. The police marvelled that I managed to escape certain drowning two times in a row, but I never told them about the mysterious black creature, the Bigfoot that came to my rescue. Two years after the event, my grandmother married Weston, and so I have the most incredible step-grandfather. Weston can still be seen taking early morning walks on the beach with Trout at his side, and occasionally he sees a long trail of over-large footprints in the sand. He smiles contentedly to himself. He knows they belong to our Bigfoot friend. Me and my mother, despite our differences, have slowly but surely repaired our fractured relationship. As when my memory did return, I told her how I regretted some of the bad choices I'd made, and she has forgiven me. My mother considers herself a religious person, believing most people when they die are going to go straight to hell. She, on the other hand, is guaranteed a grand palace in the heavenly realms, based on her righteousness. While I love my mother, I think she's the most judgmental woman I have ever had the privilege to meet. And I wonder why my father puts up with her. But that's life for you. Some mysteries can never be explained. I still wonder why that Bigfoot rescued me, twice from a deadly fate. But maybe some answers will never be known. My mother paid Drew a visit in prison believing she was going to do her Christian duty in warning him about what awaited him on the other side, based on what he'd done to me. But her ministering to him did not work. He told her to shut up, so that was my mother told off. It would seem he had no idea what clopped him across the head, but he was very unrepentant on what he'd done to me, saying his only regret was that he had not shot me in the head. He had wanted to make my death look like an accident, but I guess he never anticipated a Bigfoot coming to my rescue. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, isn't that the most incredible story? To be rescued by a Bigfoot twice in a row when you're drowning in the water. And now we know why. We know that this awful boyfriend wanted Isla dead. But Isla was also responsible in her own way. But at least she was able to admit the error of her ways. So until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs>